be uh, in the house of God tonight, and it's a blessing to uh, study his word uh, one more time. Uh, tonight we're going back to the Old Testament, and uh, there are some beautiful stories in the Old Testament, some wise words of wisdom uh, tonight from the proverbial writer uh, in the 16th chapter of Proverbs, um, where this particular chapter deals with uh, moral, uh, ethical, and spiritual precepts. And verse 13 says, Righteous lips are the delight of kings, and they love him that speaketh right. The wrath of a king is as messengers of death, but a wise man will pacify it. In the light of the king's countenance is life, and his favor is as a cloud of the latter rain. How much better it is to get wisdom than gold, and to get understanding rather to be chosen than silver. The highway of the upright is to depart from evil. He that keepeth his way preserveth his soul. Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. Tonight's lesson, what, what comes before a fall? We're talking about strength to stand. So tonight we want to look at what comes before a fall. To properly understand the importance of strength to stand, one must spend some time on that which makes one fall. For what is regarded in the secular, whether it is stated or otherwise, as making one whole, making one strong, or making one successful, is not what God requires. We're talking tonight about strength that enables one to be able to stand during difficult times. But we must make ourselves available to that strength. You are capable of achieving more than you ever imagined by the power of God and his plan to carry you to new heights of hope and love in the midst of natural disasters, economic troubles, political unrest, violent outbursts, taking center stage, you can rest assured that you have what it takes through God to live victoriously through it all. I'm sure most of you by now and heard about the LA shooting at the airport. Uh, you just never know where a violent outburst may take place. You can be minding your business with your bags, your roller bags in your hand, and all of a sudden something can break out. And, but despite whatever happens, and it's liable to happen anywhere, you have what it takes to stand. As we share our Savior with others, his best flows through us to make this world a more tolerable for you, for your presence in it. Do you not know, however, that, that you can fall? That, that you can fall? And pride is the character trait exhibited before fall. Now, I didn't come here to preach this lesson all by myself. Now, I didn't come here tonight uh, 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 for you to sit there and you put me in the refrigerator tonight. Amen? Pride comes before fall. But what is pride? Pride is defined as being high-minded, showing oneself above others. Another definition states that pride is a conceited sense of one's own superiority. Pride has caused the fall of many great and talented individuals, and you know I'm right. And I'm sure you know many people who are lifted up in pride. There are some people who refer to themselves, even in the third person. Some of our superstars will, will refer to themselves in the third person as if they're, they're talking about someone else, but as they, they're talking about themselves. I don't understand that. We breathe God's air. Walk 
own God's earth, eat God's food, enjoy God's money, enjoy and refresh by God's rain, and spend God's money, enjoy God's sun, and, and, and all the while God is blessing us through it all. The first known instance of pride occurred way before the creation of the earth. You know his name. You know it. Lucifer. Ah, the head angel in charge of praise decided he was going to be greater than God himself. Isn't that right? Ah, on one occasion, I believe it was Jesus that said, how you are fallen from heaven. Oh, Lucifer, son of the morning, how you are cut down to the ground. You who weaken the nations, for you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars. Listen to the eyes. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest side of the north. I, I will ascend to the heights of the clouds and I will be like the most high. Isaiah 14. Driven by self-deception, pride, and self-delusion and self-importance, Lucifer considered himself better than God. This explains why most of his statements began with the word I. Lucifer, whose name at one time meant light bearer, could only see his own light, was only concerned about his light. He was like the little girl who one time threw a tea party. She said on one occasion, I had a little tea party this afternoon at three. It was very small, three guests in all, just I, myself, and me. Myself ate up the sandwiches, and I drank up the tea. It was also I who ate the pie and passed the cake to me. Some of you get that when you get home. No longer a praise leader, Lucifer. No longer a majestic angel. Instead, he became one who roams to and fro on the earth like a lion looking for someone to devour. That's why Peter said you need to be sober. And you need to be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, is roaring as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Satan's pride led to his downfall. Pride and selfishness are like cousins. Ah, they hand in hand. Usually where there's pride, there's also a prevailing spirit of selfishness. It is defined as loving one's self first. Blind, pride blinds us to the truth and prevents the proud from viewing life realistically. Am I in the house tonight? The Bible said for all that is in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Is not of the Father, but is of the world. If the pride doesn't get you, then the lust will. And Satan never repented. Never repented. Instead, he tries to deceive as many of God's children as possible and drag them down to share in his dreadful den of a fallen state. When people, especially Christians, amen, who are not rooted and grounded in the word start acquiring stuff, they have a tendency to forget that at one time they don't they didn't have what they have now oh y'all making me work hard tonight before they owned a car before they could eat at the metropolitan grill before they could charge this and charge that and go here and go there wherever they wanted and stand in the closet for 10 minutes just to decide what in the world am i going to wear today they don't remember that it wasn't so long ago that they couldn't rub two nickels together. Rode the bus everywhere they went. 
always needed a ride somewhere before they lived nice and slept in a comfortable, silly, posturpedic bed. It wasn't long ago that they were sleeping five in a two-bedroom apartment. Some of you know I'm right. Before they had a 30-year tiled roof, few failed to remember that they could look through the roof and see the stars on a bright, clear night. And some of you know I'm right. In spite of their lack, they still managed to give to God, to give the God the glory, whether it was by word of mouth or by giving in the offering. They knew that God would meet their needs somehow, some way. I had some friends when I was coming up, and I always wondered why, why, when I dropped them off, uh, they never invited me in for a Coke or Pepsi or Sprite or something. It's because I found out later that they were the ones who would lay down at night and look at the stars up in the sky because they had holes all in their roof. But we shouldn't look down on people like that. Amen? Those same individuals can go on and do great things and have done in life. Mm. I remember growing up, people telling me that it wasn't until that they were grown that they realized that they were poor. They ate good, they had clean clothes, is that right? It wasn't until they were grown and looked back and realized, you know what? We were kind of poor coming up. But my and daddy always made us feel like we had exactly what we needed. And with that knowledge, where does the change come? Well, I want you to go to Daniel 4. In Daniel 4 and verse 30, you remember the prophet Daniel? Uh, Daniel recorded, Daniel recorded, re, uh, records the downfall of King Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, one day the king looked around and had uh, all that he accomplished and looked at what he had amassed and achieved, watch this, and, and stated, this is Nebuchadnezzar now, is the great Babylon, Daniel 4, 30, that I built, watch, for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty. Did you hear what he said? I built it for my mighty power. And I built it for the honor of my majesty while he was yet speaking. The Bible uh, records that a voice from heaven said, King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has what church? Has departed from you. I don't have to sign an agreement, God is saying. I don't have to deconstruct it with human hands. I don't have to get the army to remove you. I don't have to ask you to turn in your keys and uh, uh, to the palace security. I don't have to lock the gate. I don't have to burn your throne. All I have to do is speak it. It is already done. Be gone. That same hour. That once great king that built the palace for his own pleasure. At once he lost his mind and he began to act like an animal, eating grass, crawling on the ground. His hair had grown like eagle's feathers, Daniel 4.33, and his nails grew out like bird's claws. Can you see that? He was the original bird man. <laughs> he took his eyes off God as if they were ever on God and began to focus on what he did forgetting who made him great in the first place the king denied the truth thinking he was self-made man who needed nobody regarded no one as greater than he he did not want to give God the glory but instead he decided I'll give it to myself Brothers and sisters, we got to watch pride. Pride goes before destruction. The haughty spirit and pride go before a fall. One of the things listed among those things that God despises is pride. Some people call them uh, in Proverbs uh, 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 6, 17 through 19, they call them the seven deadly sins. You, you ought to spend some time on that as a list. 
and, and it said that if you look at those seven things mentioned, uh, one of them was hands that shed uh, innocent blood, a heart that devises uh, wicked schemes, feet that are quick uh, to run to mischief, isn't that right? A man who stirs up dissension among brothers. But what is interesting to me is that I would expect God to mention any uh, of these first. But you know which one he mentions first? Is a proud, a proud look. I thought about that thing. What is a, what is a proud look? We may have some trouble trying to, you know, some, you know, differentiate what a proud look is. I may look at, at this brother and say because he got his hands on his face that maybe that's a proud look. I don't know. But I know one thing, God knows, doesn't he? Is that right? God knows uh, what, a, what a proud look is. And the Bible states that these things God detests. The devil, watch this, uh, tempted Eve with forbidden fruit. And he basically said, go ahead, it's all right, you can eat of it. Because when you eat of it, you will be as God. Knowing what? Both good and evil. Uh, you will know more than anyone else. Basically, that's the a way that the devil approached Eve. He appealed to her pride. Are y'all all right tonight? You see, pride is probably at the root of the, one of the problems in our culture today. Is that uh, we're caught up in pride. Amen. And if we look at King Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar was not content with his increase. In other words, uh, uh, the palace, it wasn't enough. Uh, he wanted more. The more he was blessed, the more that he wanted. His clear case of greed then brought on self-deception. The Bible instructs us that we must learn to be content in whatever state we find ourselves. Paul learned that lesson. Paul said, for I have learned, meaning that I haven't always been where I am now, but I've figured some things out and I've come to the understanding that in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. Isn't that right? He said, I know how to live high on the hog, uh -huh, but I also know how to starve if I have to. I know how to have plenty when plenty comes. But I also know how to deal when I don't have much. In other words, uh, if I'm eating a steak today, praise God, I'm going to eat it like I've been eating steak all my life. But if there's nothing but some turkey meat and cheese, I'll be satisfied with that. Come on, y'all. Uh, uh, we got to be content. Contentment means, watch this, contentment means that you don't covet another person's property, possessions, position or personality why because you know that all you presently have and all that you are today is more than enough in the hands of God and if God bless you I know that the same God that blesses you will turn around and bless me too is that all right Whatever you need to fulfill God's purpose, you cannot do it in your own strength. Therefore, we must be content with what we have, knowing that God can take your little bit and he can turn it into a lot. But he can also take your lot. If you don't appreciate it, he'll take your lot and he'll turn it into a little bit. Now watch this. In Philippians 4.12, he said, he said, everywhere, that's Paul, he said, everywhere, and then he said, in all things, I have learned to be full. Have you ever been so full that you didn't want to see any more food ever again? Have you ever been so full? He said, I, I don't think I want to ever eat again. I know I have. There have been times that I ate so much. Y'all forgive me. 
I ate so much that, I, that you say, I, I don't think I ever want to see a, a, a biscuit, a rib again. But that's only for a little while. Eight hours later, I'm looking for a little ice cream. Matter of fact, Sunday night is a good night for some ice cream too. Amen, 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 amen. Now, so he said, he said here, I have learned to be what? Full. But also, here's what we have a problem with, being hungry. He said, I've learned how to be hungry. Mm. I've learned, even when I don't have much food, that somehow, some way, even though my stomach is growling, I know that it won't last always. He said both, watch this, to abound and to suffer need. Because he recognized I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, I haven't gone many days without food. Matter of fact, I don't know if I've ever gone, hmm, I think I've gone a day. But I always know that somehow God is going to bless me. Have you ever had your stomach growl? I mean, I'm talking about where it's like it's talk, like it's hitting you, like it's hitting you. You hearing it, you trying to hide it. And you know, folk can hear it, but they act like they don't hear it. Oh, my goodness. Paul said that even in that state, to be content. Now watch, in, in Nebuchadnezzar's case, the only help for him was repentance. Nebuchadnezzar was left in a world of insanity. He lost his mind. Here's a king. God said, just like that, your mind is gone. You not only do you not have your mind, but you also you're crawling on the ground, and you got you got hair like a like a bird, and nails like a bird, and you're on the ground like an animal. The king is reduced to animalistic behaviors because he did not give God the glory. Now, you may not enter into a world of insanity, but you cannot have God's blessing, God's covering, if you refuse to acknowledge that you've fallen and are separated from God, who is your eternal source for supply. You will find yourself in a fallen condition and unable to get up. Even when you think you're able, you are up, you're really down. Now, 1 Corinthians 4, 13, like Nebuchadnezzar, uh, many uh, may refuse to ask for God's help. As a, as a result, confusion will reign in your life when you fail to give God the glory. 1 Corinthians 4, 14, 33 says, For God is not the author of confusion. Is that right? So if you have confusion, it's not because God gave you confusion. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace as in all the churches of the saints. He lost his kingship and he roamed like a wild man until he was willing to acknowledge God. Now, now, here's the change. In Daniel 4, I hope you have time, Daniel 4, 34, look at the end of time. He said, he came to his senses. I tell you, uh, every now and then you need to recognize where your blessings are coming from. He came to his senses. He said, I, I Nebuchadnezzar, I lifted my eyes to heaven. Isn't that right? And my understanding, what did it do? Returned to me. My understanding, it returned to me. When? When he lifted his eyes where? To heaven. He said my understanding came back. Yep. And I blessed what? The most high. I blessed the most high. And I praised. And I praised. And honored him. And I honored him. That liveth forever. Who lives forever. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, you sure changing the way you're talking. Because it wasn't long ago that you were talking about what you did for yourself and what you did for your pleasure. But now he's looking where? He's looking up and he's giving praise and honor 
to the one who lives forever and who's, at the same time. Watch this. Whose dominion? Uh-huh. Is an everlasting dominion. Yeah. And his kingdom. All right. Is from generation to generation. All right. And all the inhabitants of the earth. Yeah. Are reputed as nothing. Mm-hmm. And, and then, he that doeth according to his will. All right. In the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say unto him, what doeth thou? That's good. Now at the same time, he said, my, my reason, reason returned unto me. My reason returned to me. I was restored to my kingdom. And what excellent majesty was added to me. Now I praise and extol and honor the king. He, told, he found out who the real king was. I honor the king of heaven all of whose works are truth and his ways justice and those who walk in pride which he was walking in he's able to cut down so repentance was the key to healing to fall is bad enough but to fall and not cry out for help refusing to repent is worse than the fall itself some people are so full of pride and consume with their own importance that they think if I can't get up I just stay where I am I just won't get up at all and maybe you are ashamed to let anyone know that you have fallen beloved tonight uh-huh you may feel that I don't want anybody to know just how far I've fallen so I'll stay like I am is your image so important to you that you're willing to continue to fall only to keep those who already know that you've fallen, that you haven't fa failed. Are you so deceived that you will not acknowledge that you've fallen? Stop being so proud. For pride is a dangerous place to reside because it forces you to lie needlessly. If you had asked for help immediately, you could have gotten up a long time ago. But because you're so caught up in pride, you just stay in a fallen state but I showed up tonight to tell you that there is a way back. I hung King David. You remember King David? King David went into a spiral. King David went into a descent into sin when he committed adultery. You remember when Bathsheba became pregnant with his child. David set up a husband uh, in order to be killed. The Lord had to send a prophet by the name of Nathan. Isn't that right? To reveal and convict David of his sin. David was so far out there. David was so far gone. David had gone on about his business. Am I right about it? But Nathan was sent to remind him how far he had fallen. David, uh -huh, realizing that God knows and that God sees all things. Am I right about it? Said, I have sinned against God. Oh, that's a beautiful thing. Preach, Maxwell. That's a beautiful thing. When a person recognized I've sinned against the Lord, the Lord spared David's life. And when David repented of his sins, God picked David up and put David back on his feet. What if he had not acknowledged when, when Nathan the prophet came to him and had acknowledged that it was him? What if he had said, that ain't me? That's not, I don't know who you're talking about. That wasn't me, all right? What if David had never acknowledged his sin even after the prophet came to him? No doubt David would not be regarded in scripture as he is today. You know what we call him. The only man in the Bible. A man after God's own heart. What makes a person a person after God's own heart. In this regard, we must be more like David. I'm not talking about the failures. We have enough failures of our own to last a lifetime. I'm not talking about his failures. If we never fall again, we have fallen enough already. Amen. We can be like David when we realize when we have fallen and we get up in repentance. Sometimes we fall and we're so far out there that we are unable at a particular time to get up. 
Sometimes we are so far out there that we don't even recognize how far we have fallen and really realize that we need to ask for help. Some people are just that far out there that they don't even realize now how far they have drifted. At other times we've fallen and, and just do not want to get up and try again because we know we'll fall again. But get up anyhow. Last week I closed with the prodigal son. I believe every sermon could add a little prodigal son in it. I believe every sermon you could, you could there's, a, there's a touch of the example of the prodigal son that could be included in every sermon. I believe the prodigal son can be used in, in this sermon tonight. The prodigal left home because he was lifted up in pride. Yes, he had everything and he appreciated nothing. He did not heed the warning signs that were saying danger ahead of you. Pride was in his eyes and his feet were ready to dance on the wayward streets of Broadway. He could only see the glitter, but he could not see the gloom. He couldn't look beyond the song and dance and see the agony that was before him. Pride was in his eyes so that he couldn't look beyond the thrills and the, and the frills and see the spills in life. He was so caught up that he couldn't look beyond the gags and the gifts and look down and see the grief and the sorrow. Did you all not know that I'm preaching right now? He could only see the fun and the feelings, but not the frustration that his sin would bring. He could only see the streets and the sidewalks, but not the sewer and the sewage of waiting that was stinking him up. When you have pride, you're so headed to the far country that, that you need to look out. You need to stop and look out. Don't take my word for it or even someone else's word for it. Just look around yourself. And look at all the suffering. Look at all the gloom. Look at all the heartaches. Look at all the afflictions and the loneliness and the misery and the stench and the turmoil and the pride that pride ends up bringing into an individual's life. It doesn't start that way but it always ends up bad. It, it really isn't worth it at all. Look at the victims, their brokenness, their spiritual bruises, their dreariness, their loneliness, their foolishness, their guiltiness, their helplessness, and you ask yourself, is it really worth it with no money with no clothes with no food with no bed with no friends no fun and nobody to care he had all the time he needed and then some to think about his condition after he had been stripped of all of his pride in his heart, he began to feel what his father felt when he left home. Are y'all with me tonight? He could understand the tears in his father's eyes because there were tears in his own eyes. And now he could comprehend why his father's lips had quivered. For his own lips now quivered with remorse and sorrow. And thank God that God is not a God that is quick to anger. Thank God that God is a God that is long-suffering. I thank God that God was long-suffering with me. I thank God that God has been patient with me because he doesn't want any of us to perish. But if we confess our sins, He's faithful, and God is just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If you're fallen, don't stay down. For the Lord died, and he went down into that world of disembodied spirits. Stay three days, whipped the devil, took the devil's keys, came up on the third day with all power in his hands so that we who have fallen would have a, a right to be able to get up and to live victoriously in God's kingdom. If anyone is here tonight 
And if you want to be a Christian living by faith, we give you an opportunity like we do every Sunday. Repent of your sins. I have sinned. Not somebody else has sinned. I have sinned. Not my neighbor across the street or the one on the pew behind me or in front of me. Somebody need to say, I have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Not somebody is guilty, but I am guilty. Not somebody needs to repent. I need to repent. I'm not blaming anyone else. I'm just blaming myself. God will hear you and God will lift you from your fallen condition. If you're outside of Christ, be buried in baptism. Have your sins washed away. Get up and go on and live victoriously. If you're here and you're a member of the church and you need prayer for this character trait that is sure to bring you down if you let it have its way, won't you come and be restored tonight. Ask for prayer tonight while together we stand and sing the song of invitation. What? Can wash away my sin. Nothing. What? What? Can make me what?